Well, good morning. Um, if you're joining us here in person or via the live stream, once again, we want to welcome you to uh, Fresh Vision uh, Calvary Chapel. We hope that everybody is doing well um, as usual. Uh, we want to know how you guys are doing. We do have some, actually some new uh, cards in the back there. If you have any prayer requests, any praise reports, you can fill those out uh, and you can put those in the agape box or you can give those to us uh, personally. And we also have some new church business cards as well. If you want to take a handful of those, you can share those with family, with friends. And uh, we just want to let people know that we're here. It's not a Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel thing. It's a Jesus thing. We want to let people know that uh, we're here and we want to let people know about Jesus Christ, as many people as possible. And um, of course, if you're watching via the live stream, you want more information about Fresh Vision Church or you're here, Fishers in Calvary Chapel rather, or you're here in person, I do want to direct you to our new website, fvcc, wait, fvccelp.org. Got to get used to saying that extra C in there. Um, a .com, rather, not .org. The old one was fvcelp.org. The new one is fvccelp.com. And if you go to our website, this is what the, uh, the interface looks like. And as you can see, there's a lot of information on there. There is a, I, I don't know if this comes up on this one, but there is like a, a triple bar at the upper left corner. It's not showing up here. Where is it? Oh, yeah, site menu here. So if you click on the site menu, um, there we go. Right. So on your phone app, it'll be the triple bar. But anyways, um, here are the different links to the different parts of the website. So if you want more information about our statement of faith, our mission statement, maybe a short biography uh, about Pastor Angel and his family, you can click on those links there. And then also um, the, the media link is actually the one I want to direct everyone to here. And as you guys can see, when you click on the media link, it takes you to our SoundCloud, our YouTube, our iTunes podcast. And I think at the bottom, let me see if it's on this one. Now, if you go back to the, the home page there, if you go, I think it's like in the middle part. Uh, it has links to the, it's on the ring yeah, it's at the, the bottom there. Uh, okay, here we go. At the very bottom here, we have links to our social media, our Facebook page, our Twitter, our Instagram account as well as our YouTube channel. We do want to encourage you all to subscribe. And we also want to encourage you all to share the gospel uh, by sharing the messages on your own uh, personal social media platforms. You know, right now, uh, social media is not being used very much for God's glory. We certainly want to channel the gospel message to those different avenues of uh, communication. Yes, so if you go up to, um, yeah, right here in the middle. So if you were to click on the site menu, contact us, it would take you to the middle of the web page here. And here you have like an electronic version of that postcard that's in the back there. If you have any prayer requests, any praise reports, anything you want to share with the church, you can fill it out and um, we will get back to you uh, with any information you may need. There is the, the church uh, email address as well as our phone number and our physical meeting location. There's a map at the bottom here if you scroll. And um, as you guys can see, there's also a way to give here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We don't have a formal offering. Um, however, as the Lord does lead you to give, we do have the agape box in the back of the room. And if the Lord's leading you to give electronically, we do have the link here through PayPal, which is also linked to all of our social media pages as well. Uh, so you can give through that avenue as, as the Lord leads you. Of course, the Lord loves a, a cheerful giver. And then if you scroll, I think that's all I want to say about the website here and all the past studies are there. If you have charges, you guys can see there's a uh, Pastor Angel's study from last week. And you can you can uh, look at those and all the other uh, past studies are archived there uh, on the website. And then just a couple of general announcements for the week. Uh, the men will be gathering on Wednesday uh, here at the church at 630. And um, if you want to join, if you have, if you have any questions about that, you can uh, contact the church and we'll give you that information. Or if you have any questions, if you're here in person, you can ask us after their service, but it'll be at 6.30 here um, at the church. And of course, we'll be having a youth group right after the announcements, as well as children's uh, ministry. And um, I think that's all the announcements. Thank you again for those joining us online. And um, again, feel free to reach us on our website or send a comment or question on YouTube or on Facebook, wherever you may be watching this. All right, so this week, this week we are going to be beginning a new book. We're going to be continuing on with the story of David. Um, we're going to be in, now in the second book of Samuel. And I've titled today's message, Time to Step Up. Now, 
before we begin reading and covering 2 Samuel, uh, I want to share some important details about this book. Now, I'm not going to go into a thorough um, review or overview of this book like I did when we first started, before we started 1 Samuel. And if you're interested in that, it's on our YouTube page in the introduc introductions to the books of Samuel. But I do want to mention a few important details about this book that I want you to know about. Now, 2 Samuel begins with the death of Saul, Israel's first king, and ends with the death of David, Israel's greatest king. Now, it will tell us how God and enabled David to unite the 12 tribes into one nation, defeat their enemies, expand their borders, and prepare a way for his son Solomon to take over as king. Now, one of the major themes of 2 Samuel is restoration. The restoration of national unity, the restoration of David after he sinned, and the restoration of the throne after Absalom, his, son, his other son's rebellion. Now, intertwined within this theme is the emphasis on power, showing how God empowered David and his people to accomplish his will. We'll be seeing how even though Saul, when he reigned, had torn things apart, God used David to start putting things back together again. But here's the thing. The events recorded here in this book aren't always honoring to the Lord or beneficial to his people until the nation would be divided or until the nation would be united under David. Political ambition and civil war would lead to the tragic deaths of a lot of people. Then there's also David's sin with Bathsheba and his subsequent deception, which led to David's family being torn apart and it leading the nation to a second civil war. See, David didn't always have an easy time wearing the crown or wielding the sword. But as we go through this book, we're going to see that the Lord was with his servant and ready to forgive when the king repented and confessed his sins. And we're going to see that when this happened, things would begin to heal up again. If the life of David teaches us anything, it's that God can use imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. Even though he will lovingly discipline when his servants disobey him. Now we already learned in 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14 that David was a man after God's own heart. But David was still a man and knew the weaknesses of human flesh. 2 Samuel will also teach us that no personal or national situation is beyond the Lord's ability to put things right. David's legacy was a united people, a strong kingdom. And when we get to the end of the book, we'll be seeing how at the end of his life, he turned over to his son Solomon the one thing that he wanted to do more than anything else, build a temple for the Lord. Church, we live in a shattered and fragmented world. But according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, God's eternal goal is to bring all things together in Christ. Thus, God is looking for men and women who will step up, yield to his power, and help restore broken lives, homes, churches, cities, and nations. 
And so as we're about to see with David, our Father in heaven is looking to see if you're available as well. So before we begin reading chapter 1, let's ask the Lord to speak to us through his word this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful that you have us all here together this morning, today, Lord. We are also thankful for all those that are watching online or watching this live or who may be hearing this recording or watching the recording later on, Lord. I pray that you will bless them and speak to them mightily. But I ask that you also fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Lord, we don't want to be distracted by any of the issues or problems that are going on outside this house, Lord. This, we dedicate this time to you, Lord. This is our time where we get to hear from you and where you get to just completely minister to us, Lord. And so we need that. Many of us, all of us need that right now, Lord. So bless this time, Lord. As we begin to this next book, as, as we begin this next book and into David's rise to the throne, Lord. And show us, Lord, where we need to step up as well. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Second Samuel chapter one. And the word of God says, after the death of Saul. David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed at Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man with torn clothes and dust in his head came from Saul's camp. When he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David asked him, where have you come from? He replied to him, I've escaped from the Israelite camp. What was the outcome? Tell me, David asked him. The troops fled from battle, he answered. Many of the troops have fallen and are dead. Also Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. David asked the young man who had brought him the report, How do you know Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, he replied. And there was Saul leaning in his, on his spear. At that very moment, the chariots and the cavalry were closing in on him. When he, returned, when he turned around and saw me, he called out to me. So I answered, I am at your service. He asked me, who are you? I told him, I am an Amalekite. Then he begged me, stand over me and kill me, for I am mortally wounded. But my life still lingers. So I stood over him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he couldn't, he couldn't survive. I took the crown that was on his head and the armband that was on his arm, and I brought them to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and all the men with him did the same. They mourned, wept, and fasted until the evening for those who died by the sword, for those who died by the sword, for Saul and his son, Jonathan, the Lord's people, and the house of Israel. David inquired of the young man who had brought him the report, Where are you from? I am the son of a resident alien, he said. I am an Amalekite. David questioned him, How is it that you were not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David summoned one of his servants and said, Come here and kill him. The servant struck him and he died. For David had said to the Amalekite, Your blood is on your own head because your own mouth testified against you by saying, I killed the Lord's anointed. David sang the following lament for Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the Judites be taught the song of the bow. It was written in the book of Jasher. The splendor of Israel lies slain in your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Do not tell it in Gath. Do not announce it in the marketplaces of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice and the daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. Mountains of Gilboa, let no dew or rain be on you, or fields of offerings, for there, is, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer anointed with oil. Jonathan, Jonathan's bow never retreated. Saul's sword never returned unstained. From the blood 
of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, Saul and Jonathan loved and uh, loved and delightful. They were not part, parted in this life or in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions, daughters of Israel. Weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things, who decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Your love for me was more wondrous than the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. Back in chapter 29 of First Samuel, we read how the Lord had kept <clears throat> David out of the battle in which Saul and Jonathan had lost their lives. He was instead fighting the Amalekites, who, if you remember, had raided their homes in Ziklag and kidnapped their, uh, him and his, and his uh, soldiers' wives and children. <clears throat> well, after successfully defeating them and returning back to Ziklag to recover and rebuild, he was met by a man who had come from the Philistine battlefront at Gilboa with his clothes torn and dust on his head, which are signs of mourning. The man informed David of the news of Saul's death and that of his sons, Jonathan. When pressed for details, the messenger claimed that he had found Saul leaning wounded on his spear as the enemy forces drew near. Then he went on to say that Saul asked him, an Amalekite, to administer the death blow, and that he complied with that, the king's request. But here's the thing. According to what it says, and what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 3 to 6, this report wasn't completely, completely accurate. Because it says there, among other things, that Saul had killed himself. He was dead. Otherwise, again, it would have said that he was wounded or he was hurt, that he hadn't died completely, but it said that he had killed himself, that he landed on his, that he fell on his sword and had died. And so from our perspective, he wasn't being honest. This man, this Amalekite, wasn't being honest with what had actually occurred. So what led him to lie? Why do you think that he lied? Well, here are a couple ideas. Maybe he, perhaps he thought that David would be pleased to meet Saul's slayer and re would reward him handsomely for handing him over Saul's crown and armband. Or maybe he called himself an Amalekite. Maybe he was really a Jew, an Israelite. And he had called himself an Amalekite so that Saul wouldn't be accused of asking a fellow Israelite to kill his own king, the Lord's anointed. But in the end, it didn't really matter. Because we saw in verses 11 and 12 here that David and his army immediately plunged into mourning when they heard the news. They tore their clothes off and just began to weep loudly together as a group. They expressed their grief at the disaster that had befallen the people of the Lord. You see, even though Saul and his men, his soldiers, his group of misfits, were considered outcasts in Israel, David and his men, they still regarded themselves as part of the house of Israel. They were heartbroken for those who died by the sword, for Saul, his son Jonathan, the Lord's people, 
and the house of Israel. In his grief, however, David doesn't ignore his responsibilities. He steps up. And so that evening, he asks the young man who brought him the report where he was from. When the man identifies himself as an Amalekite, David immediately rebukes him for not considering the implications of his actions. How could he? Wasn't he afraid of killing the Lord's anointed? Then he summoned one of his servants and commanded that servant to kill this alleged Amalekite for admitting that he had killed the Lord's anointed. See, David had the highest reverence for the sanctity of the Israelite king, the anointed one of God. He himself passed up more than one, one time, twice actually, the opportunity to kill Saul. But he didn't, out of respect for the king. But to this man, the way he saw it, to this man, that respect and reverence for God's chosen king meant nothing. And he couldn't just let that slide by. Now, although we as readers, those of us have, who, have, who are reading the story or who know this story, we know what really happened. David doesn't know, though. He doesn't know that this Amalekite is lying. But at this point, again, it doesn't really matter because he has confessed with his own mouth to a terrible crime that resulted, that, that needed to be paid for and which ultimately resulted in the death penalty. After this, David was now free to publicly, not privately, publicly express his grief over the death of Saul and his beloved friend Jonathan through a poem known as the Song of the Bow, which opens and closes with the words, How the Mighty Have Fallen. Now in this song, David warned against telling the tragedy in, Philist in Philistia, lest the Philistine maidens rejoice, just as the Israelite maidens had sung of the triumphs of Saul and David years before. David then cursed the mountains of Gilboa for having been the stage of Saul and Jonathan's heroic but fruitless defense against the enemy. The undying loyalty of Jonathan comes in for special praise as David viewed father and son knit together in life and death. See, even though Saul had oppressed the people at times, he had also, David said, brought them luxury and bounty. But it was Jonathan. It was his dear friend, Jonathan, whom he celebrated with his most deepest emotional words. Speaking of all the years of their unbroken friendship, he sings in verse 26 that your love for me was more wondrous than the love of a woman. Now, we have to be careful here with this verse because a lot of people out there have also misinterpreted this, this verse to mean things that it's not, that it doesn't mean. In no way does this suggest that David had a homosexual relationship with Jonathan, or even that David had a poor relationship with his wives. Rather, it speaks to an unbreakable friendship bound between men that has been witnessed countless times and in countless countries throughout history. So let me reiterate what I had said when 
we first saw the the interaction between Jonathan and David, they were friends. They were close friends, closer than brothers. Is it possible for a man to love another man in in this way without it crossing over into a sexual way? Well, we see here that it can. Men, don't be afraid of having close relationships, loving relationships with another man. Don't be afraid to tell your brother in Christ that you love them. Don't be afraid to show them that you love them. The same thing with among women. I think women have an easier time to show affection towards each other. But, yes, you can have that same kind of bond as well. So, again, it doesn't mean that he had a homosexual relationship with Jonathan or that he had problems with his wife, with his wives, but just that he loved them tremendously as as a good as a close friend. Church, this song here that we see shows us that when we sing like this, our unresolved hurt can be resolved. But where there's no such singing, we're more like the Philistines in our self-deception. We die in our uncircumcision. You see, the singing is an act, not just of lyrical skill and political courage, but it's also an act of stunning humanness. You see, it's easy to read, recall, and speak of David dancing before the ark in his joyous nakedness. But here is that same man, utterly naked in his grief, which is also the grief of his people. David knows that the loss of his king, his brother, his advocate, there is a loss in which we all, which all of us lose. David and Israel were driven to long, slow singing because there is no other language to claim what belongs to us, what cannot be denied or defeated. What we hear in Israel is honest singing in the midst of death. With the loss of their king, Israel feels emotionally defeated, emotionally broken, but they haven't been muted. They haven't been silenced. See, where the, where the muteness of death hasn't triumphed, Israel can notice the hurt, embrace the defeat, and eventually act beyond the loss. When the church loses men and women who have been greatly used by God, or you have lost a mentor who has taught you what it means to be to have a relationship with Christ, not the religion stuff or the acts of, of trying to gain brownie points with God, but when the church, when you have lost someone, again, whether it's through death, or yes, even if they've fallen because of sin and are no longer pastors or leaders or teachers or ministers or whatever, we, you, as, as a Christian, ought to be like David and sing songs of mourning like this. It's okay to sing songs like this. But sadly, Unlike David, we often just suck it up and prefer to keep our grief inside of a secret box, way down deep in the recesses of our heart, and then never speak of it. 
We imagine that the mighty do not fall, that the glory isn't slain. We imagine if we do not say it, the Philistines, or in other words, non-Christians, non-believers, those on the outside, will not notice. David, however, knew better, sang better, and acted better. And he did it publicly and unashamedly. And so should we. Shouldn't be afraid to express our sorrow, our sadness. Also, especially as men, it's easy for us in this Western, under the Western culture we live in, to hide our emotions, to keep it in check, not to show it. Because we don't want to be exposed, we don't want to be vulnerable. But let me tell you this, men. From speaking from man to man. That yeah, you know, I can see that with those on the outside. A lot of times it, we do. We it, we can feel very alone outside these walls, outside the church, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever it may be, because we feel like no one can relate to us. We feel like no one would understand us. And a lot of times that makes us feel alone. But when you're among your brothers in Christ, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. You know what? Yes, you may get hurt. Yes, it may happen. It, it, you know, it's happened to me several times. I'm sure you've experienced as well. But how will people really know about what's in your heart, about what's really going on with you, if you don't let them know? If you don't know, if you don't let them know, what are the things that make you tick? What are the things that that hurt you? What are the things that are you're struggling with? Your pains, and how is that brother? supposed to know what to pray for? How is that brother supposed to encourage you? How is that person, that brother, supposed to lift you up in Christ if he doesn't know? So wherever you're at, wherever you go, open up, man. Even though it may be hard and, you know, the Lord will lead you to the right people. He will lead you to the men that you know that you can open up to. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. Cry in front of them. Laugh in front of them. Share what's going on in your heart. Now, in the next chapter that we're about to read, David now turns to the Lord to give, in order for the Lord to give him some direction. You see, he realizes that even though he knows that He's going to be the next king of Israel. Getting to the throne won't be easy. So let's go there now and, and read chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. Sometime later, David inquired of the Lord, Should I go to one of the towns of Judah? The Lord answered him, Go. Then David asked, Where should I go? To Hebron, the Lord replied. So David went there, with his two wives, Ahinoam and Jezreel, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. In addition, David brought the men who were with him, each one with his own family, and they settled in the towns near Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and, they were, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David, It was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, The Lord bless you, because you have shown this kindness to Saul, your Lord, when you buried him. Now may the Lord show kindness and faithfulness to you, and I will also show you the same goodness to you, because you have done this deed. Therefore be strong and valiant, for though Saul, your Lord, is dead, the Lord of Judah has anointed me king over them. Abner, son of Ner, 
commander of Saul's army, took Saul's son, Ishibosheth, and moved him to Manahim. Man, 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 Mahan name, as he made him king over Gilead, Asher, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, over all Israel. Saul's son, Ishibosheth, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel. He reigned for two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, and soldiers of Ish Ishbosheth, son of Saul, marched out from Mahanaim to, to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David, and David's soldiers marched out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. The two groups took up positions on opposite sides of the pool. Then Abner said to Joab, Let's have the young men get up and compete in front of us. Let them get up, Joab replied. So they got up and were counted off. Twelve for Benjamin and, and Ishibosheth, son of Saul, and twelve for David's soldiers. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side so that they all died together. So this place, which is in Gibeon, is named Field of Blades. The battle that day was extremely fierce, and Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by David's soldiers. The three sons of Zeruah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Asahel was a fast runner like one of the wild gazelles. He chased Abner and did not turn to the right or to the left in his pursuit of him. Abner glanced back and said, Is that you, Asahel? Yes, it is, Asahel replied. Abner said to him, Turn to your right or left. Seize one of the young soldiers and take whatever you can get from him. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. Once again, Abner warned Asahel, Stop chasing me. Why would, you, why would I strike you to the ground? How could I ever look your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to turn away. So Abner hit him in the stomach with the butt of his spear. The spear went through his body and he fell and died right there. As they all came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died, they stopped. They stopped. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. By sunset, they had gone as far as the hill of Amma, which is opposite Gia, on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. The Benjaminites rallied to Abner. They formed a unit and took their stand on top of a hill. Then Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize this will only end in bitterness? How long before you tell the troops to stop pursuing their brothers? As God lives, Joab replied. If you had not spoken up, the troops would not have stopped pursuing their brothers until morning. Then Joab blew the ram's horn, and all the troops stopped. They no longer pursued Israel or continued to fight. So Abner and his men marched through Araba all that night. They crossed the Jordan, marched all morning, and arrived at Mah Mahanaim. When Joab had turned back from pursuing Abner, he gathered all the troops. In addition to Asahel, 19 of David's soldiers were missing. But they had killed 360 of the Benjamites and Abner's men. Afterward, they carried Asahel to his father's tomb in Bethlehem and buried him. Then Joab and his men marched all night and reached Hebron at dawn. We've now reached a turning point in the account of the rise of David. With the death of Saul and Jonathan, it's time for David to step up and become king. First in Judah, in the south, and eventually over all of Israel. So in the first seven verses, we learn that with Saul now dead and Israel 
without a king. David sought guidance from the Lord and was directed by him to go to Hebron, uh, one of the cities in, in Judah. There, the men of Judah anointed him as their king. In his accession to the throne of Israel, David illustrates here the career of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Like David the shepherd, Jesus came first as a humble servant and was anointed king privately. Like David the exile, Jesus is king today, but doesn't yet reign on the throne of David. Like Saul in David's day, day, Satan is still free to obstruct God's work and oppose God's people. Well, the good news is that one day, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will return in glory. Satan will be imprisoned and Jesus will reign in his glorious earthly kingdom. This is why we as Christians, as believers, we faithfully pray thy kingdom come and eagerly await the return of our king. Verse 7 then says that when they informed him, they informed David of how the men of Jabesh Gilead had kindly buried Saul, David immediately sent a message of thanks to them and also sent, invited them to recognize him as king, just as the men of Judah had done. Well, before I move on to explain the next few verses, here in these first seven verses, David sought, found, and obeyed the will of God. In the process, God fulfilled his promise to him and made him king of Judah. The timeless truth of these verses becomes clear for us becomes clear for us when we realize that David serves not only as a pattern for the ideal king of Israel but also serves as an example as an example for any believer. I'll explain that what that what I mean by that in a minute but first uh, let me mention this. Perhaps you've heard it said or maybe you've said it yourself if I could only have the same kind of experience with God as Moses or David or any biblical saint, then surely I would be as faithful as they were. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have an advantage over these biblical saints because of where we stand as born-again believers in Christ, and because of what you have right in front of you, the entire Word of God. Someone once said, as a general rule, the most successful uh, person in life is the one who has the best information. Unquote. Now, if this is true, then you and I have the potential to be more faithful than David and some of the other great biblical characters. You see, whereas David relied on the priestly ephod with its Urim and Thummim to inquire of the Lord, you and I have superior resources. Instead of a limited yes or no answers from God, we have the complete and full revelation of, of his overarching plan, which, ladies and gentlemen, is clear and understandable 
in its, in its essential details. You see, because of what we've been given by God through Christ, we have the potential to seek and find things much easier than believers of any other generation before us. The only thing that's left is obedience. And obedience is the final frontier. In a famous journal entry entitled The Tame Geese, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard imagined a land in which geese could talk. Not only could they talk, but it was also in their habit to waddle, to waddle, waddle to church every Sunday, where one of the ganders preached. The sermons were essentially the same. The geese had been given a lofty destiny and a high goal by the Creator. And every time the Creator was mentioned, the geese all curtsied and the ganders bowed their heads. By the aid of the wings of wings, the geese could fly away to distant regions. Bless, blessed climes were open were proper were properly where properly they were at home. For here there were only strangers. And so it was Sunday after Sunday. But Kierkegaard noted the unfortunate truth that each Sunday after such eloquent sermons, as soon as the assembly broke up, each waddled home to his own affairs rather than tempted to fly. All the while, the geese throve and were well-liked, became plump and delicate, and then were eaten. And that was the end of it. These first seven verses show us that David not only sought and found God's will, but after having found it, verse 2 tells us that he obeyed. And when it comes to how we can apply this text in our lives, it would be easy. It would be simple for me just to stand here and just tell you and, and, and speak on the importance of discerning God's will for your life, for our lives. But to be honest with you, it's not that easy to discern what we should do in specific situations. And it would be wrong for me, I think, just to, to tell you, because each person, it may be different for each person. During those times when you need, you're in need of clarification, or aren't really understanding God's direction in your life, you need to remain devoted to living up to the light you received. While, while you pray, and wait for further clarification. Remain in Him. Stand in Him. Keep looking at Him. Keep waiting. Don't give up. He will give you the answers you need at the appropriate time, just when you need it. It's been said that God is looking for the kind of person He can afford to bless. Thus, as an example for all believers, David is the kind of person God can afford to bless. More specifically, this text relates to 1 Samuel in demonstrating the kind of ruler God is blessed to, to is pleased to bless. This text also continues to illustrate why David is the ideal king and why he will ultimately become the standard by which all future kings will be measured. David understands that as king of Israel, he's just going to be a mere representation of the real king. He knows who really rules Israel, which is why he continues to inquire of God. Now, as we see in verses 8 through 11, not all the tribes of Israel wanted to recognize David as their monarch. Abner, the commander-in-chief of the late Saul, and also his uncle, took Saul's only surviving son, Ishibosheth, 
and proclaimed him king. And so for seven years and six months, David reigned over a single tribe in Judah with Hebron as his capital. However, it was only for two of those years that Ishibosheth reigned over the 11 tribes. Now, one possible reason for this is that it may have taken Abner five years to push the, the, the Philistines out of Israel and establish Ishibosheth on his father's throne. But also keep in mind that David had never asserted his right to the throne, and neither did he do so now. Rather, he chose to leave the matter in the hands of the Lord. It, he realized that if God had anointed him king, then God would subdue his enemies and bring him into the possession of his kingdom. And in a very similar way, our Lord Jesus awaits the Father's timing to reign over the entire world. Yes, even though his dominion, his rule, what's eventually going to happen is only known by a minority of mankind right now. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And so, from the beginning of David's reign, his real rival in the north wasn't really Shibosheth, but Saul's former military commander, Abner. As though to clear the air and settle the question of royal succession, Abner and David's military leader, Joab, appointed elite troops, 12 men on, on a side, to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat at Gibeon, the winners would decide the issues. The, the, in, the winners would decide the issue. Now, how this contest was to be conducted or the rules isn't really known. Perhaps it took the form of some kind of UFC match, which eventually ended up with knives and swords being used. In any case, a lot of people died. All those 24 men were stabbed and killed right there. And as a result of that, uh, the place where they held this contest became known as the Field of Blades. By the end of the contest, the result was victory for David's men. But they weren't satisfied to end the contest there. Instead, they made their hot pursuit they made a hot pursuit uh, of Abner for Abner and his friends, a chase that resulted in the seasoned Abner, the seasoned warrior Abner, taking the life of Asahel, the younger brother of David's military leader, Joab. Well, both Joab and the other brother, Abishai, vowed revenge. But verses 25 through 28 tell us that they gave up the chase when they saw that the odds were stacked against them. After this, Abner made his way home, made his way back to Mahanim, while Joab returned by night to Hebron. So who won? Who won that battle? Well, the answer is the body count found in verses 30 and 31. Abner, 360 dead soldiers. David, 20. It says 19, but 20 is including uh, Asahel. David had won. That day, everyone knew that the battle was over, but not the war. Now, if you already know the story, then you know that he's eventually going to win. That David is going to eventually win, but he will win at a terrible cost. The killing isn't over, and the, new, and the new throne is by no means secure. 
but yet for now. This very moment in time and what's going on here, the event that lingers over this particular battle is the unanswered death of Asahel, which will be dealt with when we get to chapter 3 next week. Now, as I begin to close, again, the challenge for you is, are you ready to step up? At any moment, the Lord could change circumstances around you and ask you to step up. Will you be ready? Even when things are, even when you've gotten horrible news and you're grieving and heartbroken, are you ready to step up for the Lord? So what, what will your answer be? No, not right now. I've got to take care of a few things. I'm busy. Let me finish what I'm, what I'm currently working on. Let me, uh, you know, let me raise my kids first. Let me bury my mother and father first. And then I'll be ready. Or will you say, now, Lord, I'm ready. Use me in any way you want. I'm ready. We have a good Heavenly Father. He knows your situation and He knows your circumstances. He isn't going to allow you or tell you to abandon your responsibilities or abandon your wife and your children and give up your bills and, you know, give up, you know, the things that you need that are needed. But He will challenge you. So again, are you ready to step up? Now, as I as I close, I want to now speak to those who are watching and listening. And the Lord may be speaking to you right now, asking you to step up. Maybe He's speaking to your heart right now and telling you, hey, come to me. Humble yourself and come to me. What will you do? So, if that's what He's doing in your heart, and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Pray this prayer with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died on the, for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins. I repent and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I now ask you, fill me with your Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely prayed that, let us know. Reach out to us. Contact us on our website or one of our social media sites. Welcome to the family of God. We want to help you in your next step, so maybe we'll send you a Bible and just or just speak to you privately on where to find a church. Or we open, you know, we want to invite you here, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel in Northeast El Paso. You're definitely welcome here, and you'll find a home here. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So until next week, goodbye and farewell.